week and while Angie had her fall break, um, we went down to Oklahoma to see some, uh, some, some friends and uh, went to church last Sunday at a, at a Baptist church in the town of Jinx, which is just a suburb of Tulsa. And uh, we went there because the, the lady that was my children's ministries pastor when I was pastoring, and that, that's where she and her husband was, and we wanted to try to cross paths with them while we were in town. And uh, went to church there and kind of give you a sense of the way my mind works. I, I walk in and it's, it's, a, it's, a larger, it's a larger worship center than ours, but it's one that has chairs rather than pews. And I walked in and the very first thing I noticed was the lines on our chairs are straighter than their lines on their chairs. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, I just, I, 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 I don't know why. It's just, I, I, I would like to sometime go to another church and not evaluate and just enjoy. It's, it's, it's hard. You always sit there and you're kind of evaluating things. And that's the very first thing I noticed is their chair lines are crooked. <laughs> so anyway, this morning we're continuing with series that, uh, we began 1st of October, did a couple of weeks, gone last week, we're going to jump back in. A series called It's Okay Not to Be Okay. And, and what we're doing with, for those of you that haven't been here, what we're doing during this series is we're looking at some of the common areas of struggle in our lives. And how God wants to use those things to draw us closer to Him. Um, how those things that we often classify as being, you know, debilitating or incapacitating, how those can actually serve a positive, productive purpose in the hands of God. You know, sometimes things come into our lives and it's, it's, it's like they're a wedge. And the question is, is the wedge going to come between us and God? Or is the wedge going to come in on the side to push us closer to God. And I think all these things can serve that latter purpose if, if, we will left that, if we'll let them. Just to kind of remind you, we began the first week talking about loneliness, how loneliness is one of the chronic issues of our day and our time. That, that we've got all manner of devices that are meant to help keep us connected, but yet we are perhaps as lonely a society as any society on the face of the earth. But God wants to use that loneliness to draw us closer to an intimate fellowship with Him. We talked a couple of weeks ago about anxiety, about, about worry. And certainly, you know, when you look around the world around us, there are a lot of things to be worried and anxious about. Um, you know, you think about loneliness, you think about anxiety. Those, those are two very familiar, very common areas that I'm sure all of us wrestle with from time to time. And so today I want us to deal with another one that I believe is just as common, just as familiar, just, just as real, just as universal. And that's the reality of guilt. Guilt. The, the residue of our depravity. The, the, the residual junk from our rebellion and our sinfulness. I'm sure that plagues all of us at some level for, from time to time. I remember he hearing a statement. Uh, this was some years ago. I, I don't remember the context. I don't remember who said it. But, but I, I sat there and when I heard it, I sat there and thought, man, I, I, I identify with that. My guess is you probably do as well. It's very honest. It's very forthright. It said, if you knew the person that I was on the inside, you'd probably spit in my face. Because all of us, all of us, we've got stuff lurking in our lives that's nasty. That's, 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 that's ugly. That's sinister. You know, maybe it's a suppressed addiction. Maybe it's thoughts that, that, that are not pleasing or, or you know, adulterous. Maybe, maybe it's a critical spirit. Maybe it's greed. Maybe it's, you know, runaway ambition. It, it can be a number of things. And, 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 
and it's not to say that, that, that we're a bunch of phonies and frauds and hypocrites. We're, we're all in the process of being transformed by the grace of God. But we also all have bouncing around within us the debris of a rebellious past. You know, we're redeemed by the grace of Jesus. We're, we're experiencing the ongoing work of transformation. But how we deal with the guilt of the past... How we handle the residue of our sin. I think that's pivotal to us continuing to develop and grow as followers of Jesus. In fact, I dare say how we handle that might be the single most important factor in us becoming the person God wants us to become and us realizing the possibilities that he has for us. So what I want to do this morning, I want to do a couple of things. Number one, I want to talk about some practical steps we can take, how we should react and respond to our guilt, some things we can do to, to, to process it, to dispose of it. And then second, I want to talk about why, why the cross of Jesus is necessary. Why the cross of Jesus is an indispensable part of the solution to our guilt. Now, that's the terrain I want to try to cover this morning. How, to, how should we handle it and why the cross is essential. As, as I think about how to handle our guilt, it seems to me there are four essential and sequential steps that we need to take if we're going to effectively deal with our guilt. Four essential and in order, sequential steps. Each of them begins with the letter R. The first is realize. The realization. One of the things about sin is that we're in the midst of, when we're in the midst of it, it's often difficult to see it. Or, or maybe more accurately, we, we, we choose not to see it. We, we, we deceive ourselves. And so the first step towards dealing with sin and guilt is to realize we've sinned. You know, God, God is interested in growing us up. God is, is wants to help us not live lives that are crippled and disabled under the shadow of our guilt. And so God, one of the gifts that he brings us, and maybe in the moment we don't perceive it as a gift, but, but one of the gifts he brings us is he brings conviction to bear upon our lives. But if we disregard that, if, if we ignore that conviction, we, we will dampen our sensitivity to him. And we'll become more calloused, we'll become more deadened, and guilt will become even more and more of an issue long term. Everything starts with the realization that we've sinned. And this should foster the second thing, which is regret. Wishing we hadn't done what we did. One of the things about regret, however, is regret... See if this makes sense to you. Regret often has more to do with the fact we're having to pay for what we did than anything else. Quite often, regret is more about the adverse consequences we're facing rather than it is contrition for the act itself. Tracking with me? And so regret isn't in and of itself enough. Regret should lead us to a third step, which is remorse. And when you move from regret to remorse, you experience spiritual sorrow. Anguish not so much for what your actions have brought upon you, but anguish for the fact that by doing what you've done, you broke the heart of God. And this is a step, this is a move that needs to happen. Because when, when it doesn't happen, when, when, it, when we don't move from regret to remorse, what, what tends to happen, what tends to take place is, is it, it, it almost cultivates this, this militant spirit in us that seeks to justify our actions. 
He says, hey, what I did, it was understandable. What I did was unavoidable. We justify our actions. But when genuine remorse is present, we don't justify. In fact, when genuine remorse is present, it leads us to the fourth step, which is repentance. In repentance, we realize what we've done and we experience authentic remorse for what we've done and we seek to turn from it. I mean, that, that, that's the literal word or the meaning of the word repentance. The, 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 to repent in the original language, to repent is to be heading in one direction and come to realize, man, that's the wrong way and sit there and say, I'm going to do a 180 and head in the other direction. That's what it means to regret, repent. With regret and remorse, we turn around and, and, and head in the way we should have been going all along. Realization, regret, remorse, repentance. And one of the things I've noticed about many of us that profess to be followers of Jesus is that we fall into this repetitive cycle of confession that seeks forgiveness without ever moving to repentance. You know, we, we commit a sin, we confess it, we ask God to forgive it, but we never really repent of it. You see, when you repent, it doesn't mean you're just sorry for what you did. <coughs> Repentance is about turning around. It's about quitting what you were doing. It's about changing. And it's when we repent that we truly are forgiven. And it's when we repent that we truly do have our sin and our guilt absolved. And then the challenge once that happens is, is to walk in that forgiveness. I love the way that Corey Tim Boom put it. You've, maybe you've probably heard this quote before. She said, when God forgives us, He takes our sins to the deepest part of the ocean. He attaches a large weight. He drops them overboard and He puts, puts up a no fishing sign. <laughs> We tend to fish, don't we? The feelings of guilt rarely just vaporize. They linger. And when they linger, it sometimes, and in fact, more than sometimes, oftentimes, makes us question the extent and the degree of God's forgiveness. You know, it's, it's like I read, I read an article a while back about what happens with amputees. You know, people who've lost a limb, a hand, a leg, they, 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 will, they, will, they will often experience neurologically, they will often experience the sensation of a phantom limb. You know, they, they, they've lost their, their leg, they, they've lost their arm. But, but yet, there's somewhere locked in their brains, there's a, there's a memory so real, so strong, that they can, they, they can, they can feel their, their, their hands crass, gla, uh, clasp into a fist. They can, they can feel their toes curl, even though their hand or their, their toes no longer there. That's kind of the way guilt works in our lives. Our sin's been eliminated it's been dispatched, but we can still feel the effects. And God doesn't want that for us. God wants us to know freedom from that. And that brings us to the second thing that I want to talk to you about this morning. It's about the cross. And, 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 and why the, the cross is a necessary part of the solution. I remember, this was some years ago. Um, I, I was sitting down with a guy in the church that I pastored. And we were having a conversation. Um, and he asked me one of those questions that... 
I, I didn't know how to answer. Smart guy. A thoughtful guy. And, 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 and essentially what he said to me was, Pastor, I understand. I understand we've all done wrong stuff. I, I understand that we need to ask God to forgive us of that wrong stuff we've done. But why couldn't God just say, I forgive you and be done with it? Why? Why was the cross necessary? And I kind of sat there and went, um, uh, you know, that's a good question. <laughs> it's a question in many ways that kind of set me on a quest. And so what I want to do during the rest of our time together is speak to what I discovered as a result of that quest. And I think the insights will help us as it relates to the, the, these feelings of guilt and regret, remorse that, that all of us deal with at, at some level and in some way. One of the things you'll notice if you read the Old Testament particularly one of the things you'll notice, won't take long for you to notice, is some really bad stuff happened to animals in the Old Testament. You know, they'd be slaughtered. They'd, uh, their, their, their blood would be taken and sprinkled on furniture. Their, their, their fat would be burned on the altar. You know, it's the kind of stuff that people from PETA would just be outraged terribly. <laughs> you know, to, to, to look at what went on in the Old Testament. And, and, and I'm sure many of us look at that from our vantage point and say, what's up with that? Well, what will help us understand is when we realize that animal sacrifice, it wasn't a practice the Bible invented, it wasn't a practice the Hebrew people invented, it was a widespread practice that was basically a part of all religious systems back in that day. Universal practice, regardless of which God you believed in. And, and, and yeah, there's a part of us that looks at it and it seems so odd that we sit there and say, you know, we must be way more enlightened than they were. But that there's a couple of ideas that if we can kind of dig into, there's a couple of ideas expressed in the notion of animal sacrifice that, that helps us understand why they did it. That helps it make more sense. One of them was the general belief in the ancient world that we need help. The ancients did not believe like many people in our day do that we're the masters of the universe and that we're in control. They didn't think that. They thought we're not in control. You know, that, that, that notion, it's very much at odds with the prevailing tenor of our day. I think a lot of us live with the assumption, hey, we're smart, we're insightful beings. If we apply ourselves, we, we, we can bring about a glorious destiny. I mean, we've got, we've got all these techno, technological advances. We've got the, 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 the blessing of education. We, we can create this, this magnificent future. The ancient people didn't believe that. They believed we need help. A second idea that was prevalent in the ancient world, and again it may be at odds with the kind of what's going on in our society, not necessarily here in the church, but just in our society as large. A second idea prevalent in the ancient world is that there is a realm beyond this world. That what we can see and touch and taste and feel and hear, that that, that isn't all there is. There's a realm beyond this world. And they also believed that sacrifice was an important way where they could connect with that realm. You know, to, to our way of thinking, if you sacrifice something, you lose it. You know, if, if, if you sacrifice some money, if you, you sacrifice a possession, if you sacrifice uh, some of your time, it, it, it's gone. You lose it. You, you can't recapture it. 
But in the ancient world, sacrifice didn't carry the idea of loss so much as it carried the idea of transfer. To sacrifice something was to transfer it from this world to that other world. In fact, the etymological origin of the word sacrifice is to make sacred. That's what sacrifice really means. The, the object, it, it may still be here, it may still be usable on earth, but because you've sacrificed it, it's now been made available to heaven. And so, so when you read in the Bible about sacrifices being offered... Well, one of the things you'll often hear is you, you read about that. You, you'll hear about the sacrifice being a pleasing aroma. You remember re reading those, those, those words in the Bible? That the sacrifice was a pleasing aroma to God. Now, the best way I know to explain it is kind of like what happens when you put a steak on the grill. I know some of you guys cook outside. And, 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 and you put a steak on the grill and, and then there, there is this distinctive smell that goes up. From the grill. Now, now, now the meat is still there. In fact, that, that meat is going to be eaten here in short, not too long, by, by somebody. But there's a sense in which, because this aroma went up, there's a sense in which it's also in the presence of the divine and available to his use. That, that's the idea behind sacrifice. One other thing that will help this make sense is to understand the ancient people, they viewed the gods as more powerful versions of us. Just like us, the gods could be weak. They, they, they could be needy. They, they could be fickle. And so because the gods were like us, there was this kind of system that grew up that said, folks need to do stuff for the gods because it's in return that the gods will do stuff for us. You know, the gods needed a place to live, so people built them a temple. The, the gods were hungry, so people offered them food. It's kind of like there was this understood quid pro quo arrangement in the world that you offer stuff to the gods and the gods will in turn give you stuff back. And so you've got a God who has identified the people of Israel as his people and is going about trying to teach them that, hey, I'm not like that. That's not the case. That there's not a bunch of weak temperamental gods that, that you've got to continue off these sacrifices to in order to meet their needs. But there's only one God. And this God is consistent in character. And He is supremely good. And the way, I believe, the way that God chose to do that to teach the people of Israel that primarily was through revising the sacrificial system. Taking this practice that other people did, but making some changes to where it was done differently because this God is different than all those other gods. Does that, does that make sense? You know, that, that, that's why in Israel there's only one temple. Because there was only one God. You know, and, and as we go forward, we realize that, 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 it, that he said, you know, I, I don't need a house. I, I want to live within you. If you'll let me. Your, your heart, your life, your, your, your body can be a temple. It can be a dwelling of God. It can be the place of God's presence here on this planet. And he also wanted to teach us That he didn't make us as humans because he needs something from us. God made us as humans because he has so 
much love to give. And he needed some place to pour it out. The, the, these words from, from Psalm chapter 50. Uh, the, listen to these, beginning at verse 9. Listen to what the psalmist says. He's, he's, he's speaking as, as if or from the vantage point of God. He says, I have no need of a bull from your stall or of goats from your pens. For every animal in the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the creatures of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that's in it. I mean, these words, I, I know they make sense to us. But, but these words would have been revolutionary. These words would have been totally nonsensical to people of the ancient world. A God that doesn't blow hot and cold. A God that's not periodically lacking. That, that was a concept that did not compute to them. And lest you think, well, those ancient people were just dumber than we are. Lest you think that, people offering their lives and sacrifices to idols didn't end with the ancient world. Still a very common pastime. We do it. Just looks different, but we do it. All of us have idols that we will offer sacrifices to from time to time. Many of us know people that have sacrificed their family for material success. Many of us know people that have sacrificed their integrity and their reputation for a thrill or a tryst. Many of us have sacrificed our money for a substance that cannot deliver the peace and the calm and the sense of serenity that we're so desperately seeking. Folks, we are in many ways just like the ancient people. We are very much in the business of offering sacrifices to idols. It just looks different in our day. And this leads to another problem that, was, that, that was, had to be communicated through the sacrificial system that had to, be, had to be addressed. Namely, the problem or the idea that the biggest problem in the world is out there somewhere. And God said, no, the biggest problem in the world is in here. You know, part, part of the appeal of idolatry is that the worldview is really convenient for us. It's like, I just need more money, I need better health, I need better crops, I need this, that, and the other. And so, so, so let me try to manipulate the powers that be in order to get what I want. But God says, hey, there's a problem, but it's not out there, it's in here. Folks, the biggest problem we're dealing with here is not a matter of our circumstances. It's the fitness and the condition of our soul, our heart. That, that's why the psalmist says these words in the 51st Psalm. Listen to what David says, verses 16 and 17. I know you've heard these verses before, but I think if you hear them in this context, they'll hit you with a fresh significance. He says, you do not delight in sacrifice or I'd break it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Again, those, those words, that they would have been so revolutionary, so at odds with the belief and the understanding of the people of the ancient world. Ancient people thought that God just wants sacrifice. I don't have to be good. I don't have to be ethical. I don't have to be chaste. I just have to give them stuff. And if I give them stuff from time to time, I'm good. 
But the psalmist says, "Uh uh-uh. Not the way it works. Problem's not out there. Problem's in here. Problem is sin. The problem is this propensity we all have to take these things that cannot save and are not worthy and give them our ultimate allegiance. There's this brokenness inside us that makes us deceitful. There's this brokenness inside us that makes us hurt people that we're supposed to love. There's this brokenness inside us that makes us apathetic to the destructive things that are going on in the world that we could do something about, but we choose not to because we've got more important things to tend to. And what happens is that over time, over time, we don't think about our failure to follow through. We continue to think of ourselves as these generous, gracious people. We, uh, we, we, we betray our values. We, we, we try to promote ourselves. We, we, we make everything in life a service of our ego. And then we repeatedly mess up in ways that wound other people. Folks, that's what's wrong with the world. The problem with the world is not something that's going to be, as I said earlier, it's not something going to be solved through public policy. The problem with the world is going to be solved through transformed hearts. When Jesus, you recall, when Jesus started his public ministry, the Bible describes that. It says that he came proclaiming the good news. He said, the kingdom of God has come. It's among you. And in other words, the great transfer between this realm and that realm, it's begun. But the transfer is not about or not because we have to take stuff from down here, up there. The transfer has started because God and Jesus has brought the essence of up there, down here. And he says this, this, this way of life, that this, this manner of operating, it, it's, it's available to you. I mean, a a great way to think about the kingdom of God is the kingdom of God is that place where wherever you might find it, the kingdom of God is that place where the will of God is being done. But as you well know, there's a lot of other kingdoms in this world. There's a lot of other wills that are opposed to God's will. And, And human kingdoms, when they meet opposition... Human kingdoms typically seek to overcome the other kingdom by force. That's why we have wars. That's why we have battles. That's why we have some of the partisanship we have in our country. We're trying to overcome the opposite kingdom by force. But Jesus couldn't do that. And the reason why Jesus couldn't do that is because what Jesus wants to win is not something that can be gained by a show of power. What Jesus wants to win is our hearts. And folks, you don't win somebody's heart by overpowering them. You don't win somebody's heart by overwhelming them. You win somebody's heart by surrendering. Why do we, when we propose, get down on a knee? Because we want to win the heart of that person. You can only win somebody's heart by yielding 
in love. And folks, that brings us back to the cross and why the cross was necessary for our salvation. In the cross, Jesus proposed to us. He, he, he yielded in love. And in doing that, he turned everything upside down. I mean, Rome and the, and the religious leaders and, 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 and those that were opposed to Jesus, I mean, they, 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 thought, they thought they defeated him, didn't they? they? They believed, man, we're winning, we're triumphing. But when Jesus died, he showed love stronger than all that. That love's stronger than sin, it's stronger than guilt, it's stronger than death, it's, it's stronger than whatever. I mean, Jesus looked like he was losing, and from an earthly perspective, he was losing. But in reality, folks, he won. Because forgiveness always means costly suffering for the one that forgives. Always. And if we were going to be forgiven by God, then he had to suffer to make that possible. And that brings us back to the reality of the guilt. I realize it's been a long way around, but I hope you've been able to make this lap around the track with me. Brings us back to the reality of our guilt. Why was the cross necessary? It's necessary because what God wants from us is not just stuff. What God wants from us is us. He wants us fully. He, he, he wants us completely. He, he wants us without prohibition, without reservation. And so in order to get that, God knew I can't overwhelm them and impress them with my power. I, I want to have the kind of relationship with them where I can lavish and pour out my love upon them. And so he went to the cross. And when you and I come to the cross and recognize the problem isn't out there, but it's in here. The, the, the problem's not external, the problem's internal. When we come to the cross realizing that we're a sinner with regret and remorse and repentance, we come away with a purposeful and personal relationship with this God. And it's one in which our sin and guilt has been dispatched and removed and taken care of. We don't have to live with guilt. It's been dealt with. Our job is to realize regret, allow it to move us to remorse, and then to repentance. I just sensed this morning there perhaps were some, some of us 